Hi, I'm your host, Erica Polsonelli, and welcome to Evolve by Erica, the podcast, where we talk all things spirituality, ascension, health, wellness, and beyond. I'm so excited that you are here. Come on in. Hello, guys, and welcome to another podcast. Today, I have a special guest named Tara, who is here to share all about her spiritual journey and how it has helped her through her most challenging of days. I felt instantly connected to her and her story, and she was just so vulnerable, open, and honest with us, and I really can't wait for you to hear this conversation. I hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, just by your mic check, I could tell that you were. <laughs> we're starting right there. Can you just do that again for us? <laughs> check, check, one, two, one, two, test. <laughs> <That's I'm>, intro. <laughs> I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So excited, Laura, just knew to connect to us. Yes. She's and amazing. I know she really is. Laura is the reason why this podcast is a thing. And she'll always like, she has such amazing people in her life. And she's like, I just feel like you guys need to meet. And as soon as she says that, I'm like, let's go. Done. And we were chatting. Well, why don't you introduce yourself first? <laughs> go ahead. All right. So my name is Tara Natalie. Uh, I'm a yoga teacher, a Reiki, Karuna Reiki master, a meditation teacher. I'm a mom of two beautiful babies. Um, I'm a wife, and I'm also a co-manager of my husband, who's in the entertainment business. Wow. It's a long intro. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. I wear many hats. Yeah. So when we were chatting off air, you were sharing about like your past life. And for a moment, I thought you literally meant like a past life. But then I caught on that you were talking about this lifetime, right. just like just... what you were doing previously in your yes. previous chapter. So before all of these wonderful things that you're doing now, can you share about what you were doing then and your journey? Yeah. So, so yes, I call it my past life at this point because it feels like a lifetime ago, but it was in this lifetime. And it's the reason that I have my husband in my life. So we met because I was a singer. So I was a singer. I was signed to Desert Storm. Um, I had songs with John Legend. I opened for Neo in Japan. Um, I toured with my husband. That's so cute. Yeah. So. And didn't you mention Fabulous too? Mm -hmm. I did, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'm on one of I Fab's love songs. some like two thousands yes. hip hop oh, that we love speaks Fabulous. to my He's soul. So good. <laughs> He's still so good. So can you just give me a little insight of like that life? I want a picture into that world. Yes. Okay. So first of all, it was hard in the sense that for my family, right? I was the first one in my family to go down a path like that, a creative path. Um, my parents, my dad is an immigrant here. And my mom was here, but she didn't come from, you know, a quintessential good life, right? So they worked really, really hard to get me into a good neighborhood and to get me into good schools and to give me all the tools. And then I'm like, eh, I think I want to be a singer. And they're like, no. <laughs> I understand. Right? So, um, so that was hard. Um, but I was very set on it. I was, I was, I loved music. I loved playing piano. From what I loved age? Singing. So my parents, I tell my mom all the time, it was her fault because she had me playing piano at the age of two. So that was her gift, right? It was something that she never got to do. Yeah. It was, right? That was a privilege to be yeah. able to get her daughter a piano and to have me play. So I started playing at two. And then when I was about 13, I made a deal. So I was a good no negotiator from young. I was like, I'll keep playing piano if you let me take voice lessons. Wow. So that was the deal we made. So then I started taking vocal lessons. Um, and technically, I guess in some senses, some people would say I started late. Like, I didn't perform in front of my family until high school. So, you know, I, it took some time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into school. I was going to Fordham. I wanted to go to school in Washington. But then I got into Fordham. And I felt like, and I got a scholarship at Fordham. Wow, good for you. So I felt like, thank you. So I felt like it was a sign. Yeah. So I felt, okay, I could stay in New York. I could continue 
to do what my parents want me to do, which is go to school. And I could also continue to go to auditions in the city, work on my music. So I kind of had the best of both worlds. So that was the journey there. So I guess, yeah, like 18, 19 years old, I got my record deal at 19, continued working. My first big job was for Reebok. How do you get a record deal? Hustling hard. Like what? What do you do? You send so your music I started, to places? You've, again, just so many random interactions. Yeah. So I was at a nightclub, made friends with some people in the nightclub. They heard my voice. They took me to a recording studio. I recorded music. Then I bumped into the person who's now my producer because I was dating a guy. And then that guy becomes my producer. And then that guy, which is crazy, and that guy's name is Jeremy. Jeremy, so Jeremy met me when I was 19. Produced my music, everything I did. He then wound up becoming the producer for my husband. Oh, wow. Crazy, right? So that's why, like... To this day? To this day. Wow. And now we co-manage my wow. husband together. Wow. So it's so incredible because of the evolution. Yeah. And although I'm not doing music in that sense anymore, I'm still working with all the people. Everyone who was on my team is now on my husband's team. And my husband had a number one, like three top tens and one number one with wow. the team. So awesome. So it's like so incredible because you don't always know where the path is going to take you. Yeah. But I know that my husband wouldn't have had his journey if it wasn't for me so wild and right? so special it is yeah it's really special so where when did you know that you were ready to transition out of that world was there like a moment yes a few? there was so i suffered with anxiety and depression in high school so around 19 is when i also found yoga and i found hot yoga and hot yoga changed my life Bikram. Bikram. That's where I started because that's the only thing that existed at the yes. time. Yes. Yeah. Um, that was like the first heated yoga ever. Yeah. Right. I mean, from what I understand. It's the yeah. It was yeah. The creation. It was definitely the creation of it. Yeah. Um, and it was what I needed. Yeah. Vinyasa yoga was not for me at that time mm. because it it only actually amplified my anxiety. Because I didn't know what was coming. Yeah. So it was actually very scary for me to go to a vinyasa class. And it would actually, and it didn't serve me mm -hmm. because I, I didn't feel held and supported. Yeah. At that time, the Bikram practice was everything I needed because it gave me such a sense of security. Yeah. Because I knew what was coming. I could go anywhere. Yeah. I could go to any country. Yeah. And I could walk into a studio and I could drop my mat down and I could do it. Yeah. And that was what I needed at that time in my life. So I'm always so grateful for my Bikram yoga practice, the, the yoga of it, you know? So 19 to 25, yoga is my lifeline. I continued doing my school, I continued doing my music, my acting, my modeling, all the things in New York City, living my like, you know, best life. Um, and the yoga is what's supporting me. That's what keeps me grounded, that's what keeps my anxiety at bay. I'm good. Then, I shouldn't say I'm good. It's, it's hard, right? Being a woman in the music industry is hard. Yeah. Especially then. You know, this is yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. Right? So it was very different. Um, I was definitely in compromising situations. I definitely had many moments where I felt like I had to do things go to dinners, be in rooms that I wasn't comfortable being in because it was an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't go to the dinner and do the things or go into the office and close the door and have inappropriate chats, that I would lose the opportunity. Yeah. Right? So that was hard. Yeah. And it's so dimming yeah but I did it because I had a goal and I just kept pushing um and then I met my friend at the time he was my friend right 
And at that time, we, it was amazing because it was like, I felt seen. Because he was another brown boy. He was from England, but he was Indian. He had the same family background. And he was the first, same like me. You know, the first in our families, really the first in our industries to be trying to be pop R&B stars. So we really understood each other. Yeah. Um, so we became, we, we met over a weekend in Miami and we became instant friends. Aww. It was instant. Um, I would say, I have said that like, I knew I was going to marry him after that weekend. We were just friends, nothing happened, yeah. but just the connection was so strong. Um, and then he came to America with the excuse of wanting to work with my producer. <laughs> <laughs> it was really to hang out with me. Um, but it all worked. It all worked. And we continued making music together. We wrote songs together. We toured together. I would fly to Germany to see his shows. He flew to Japan to see my shows. Um, and then I was just getting tired. Yeah. I was getting tired of the industry. And I think what really was happening for me was I was getting sad because I was losing my love for music. And I didn't want to lose my love for music because that was, music was healing for me. Mm. And I knew that that wasn't okay. Yeah. I knew that it wasn't okay for me to turn on the radio and like hear a song and be disappointed that it wasn't my song. And my song sounds just like that one, so why did her song make it and mine yeah. didn't, right? And I didn't want to feel that way. So I was teetering. I knew I wasn't feeling okay. And then I had an article come out. And the article, I was so excited for the article to come out. We had spent two days working on it, doing a photo shoot. Um, I'd say like four or six hours of interviewing me. And I was so excited. And then the article came out and the headline that they used was basically clickbait. And it just took my words slightly out of context. And the thing for me was that although I was going into this pop world and into this industry, I was still also really, it was really important to me that I set a really positive message and that it was something that my younger cousins would be able to look at and be proud of me all of those things were really important to me because that's just how I was raised and it's still part of who I am and I think it, it was again it was all part of the evolution right like my goal now is to spread as much love and light and peace into the world as I can and that was still important for me then and I felt like the article that got taken away from me and my voice was used in a way that wasn't my own mm -hmm. um, and I was done it was like I'm done. I knew that was the moment. Wow. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Charles. I can't lose who I am yeah. to this. Yeah. And we were in, I'll never forget, we were, we were in Birmingham, Birmingham. Can't say it proper. I have to say it properly. Birmingham, England. Um, I was not yet engaged, but soon to be engaged. I knew it was coming. Um, that's a whole other story. Um, we were there, it was March, and I called the Bikram Yoga headquarters in California and said that I wanted to do the fall training. And she's like, but there's a training starting next month. And I was like, I can't possibly like make that happen. Yeah. She said, I'll help you. And I never got to wow, thank that woman. I've chose. I never got to thank her. And it's still, I don't know, maybe I should just call back to headquarters. And because that woman changed my life. She's wow. Like, she's like, I'll help you. And we did it. Wow. And in two weeks, I was in Acapulco, Mexico, immersing myself in Bikram yoga for nine weeks, two classes a day. Knew no one, knew nothing. I wasn't prepared. Was Bikram there? He was there. He was. He was there. He would come in and out. He wasn't there the whole time. Yeah. How was that? Listen, everyone has their, yeah. their experience. My experience was that he pushes you to the point where you think you're going to break. Yeah. 
And then you find out that you're not going to break. Wow. Wow. And, you know, I get it. I saw him. I can't speak to the other things because yeah. that wasn't my experience. Yeah. So I cannot speak to it. Can I say yes? They're probably... It's so complicated. Yeah. I think in all of these relationships, again, with men in power and women wanting to... It, there's such... This yeah. the way that the relationship works gets very confusing and skewed mm -hmm. and unhealthy. Um, but what I did 100% see was people who thought they wouldn't graduate who wind up becoming the best because of him pushing you and the way that wow. he pushes you. Wow. You know, and it's... I love the discipline of Bikram yoga. I still love it. Yeah. And although I don't teach Bikram classes anymore and I own a studio, I miss some of the discipline and I still sprinkle it in when I can yeah. because I think that it's important. Yeah. Even as adults, we need a little bit of discipline. We need to know that the door's gonna lock. You need to <laughs> get here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that you're a priority. So the other stuff needs to wait yeah, because you need to get in this room because you need to do this work yeah, and this work is hard and you are going to want to leave and you are going to want to walk out yeah, and you can't yeah, because it's easy to walk out and it's easy to not do the hard things. The hard things are what freaking change us. Yeah, it's so true. So I'm grateful for, for my journey in that world, you know, and it took me to where I am today and I wouldn't be here. Wow. If it wasn't for it. So that was the catalyst for you to open up the spirituality and all the other modalities yes. that you share and it teach now. Bikram yoga, yoga opened me up to my meditation. Um, and I continued on that hot journey as the studios all started changing and then I had to start changing and I had to start doing vinyasa because it became a big part of the practice. And I was so scared because Vinyasa scared me. Why did it become a big part of the practice? Because a lot of the studios started changing. Yeah, because they didn't want to teach Bikram solely um, anymore? Is that I think I not even just because, yeah, because the the market was changing, okay. right? So more and more people were doing yoga and they wanted the hot yoga, but they didn't necessarily want the Bikram yoga. Yeah. You know, so they started changing and adding in different things. And I had to... I had to change with the times. Yep. You know, as we do. Yeah. So that's what opened me up. And then I stayed in the music industry. So I did the nine week training. I started teaching in England, loved it, amazing. And then I kind of had to transition back into the music industry, but this time I switched my lens. So now I was no longer in front of the camera, I was behind the camera. So then I started co managing my husband. What started off as an assisting job became assisting, became you know, day-to-day -man -day manager and now full-time co-manager. Wow. Um, and I love it. I love, and again, like, I know that the journey of where I came from gave me a different understanding for him because I know what it is to be an artist. So when someone sends me a schedule for him, I'll look at it and say, this is not going to work. Yeah. This is too hard. You cannot expect him to show up and be fresh faced for this many yeah. things when he, you know, because I know. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not afraid to say, no, this is yeah. not going to work, you know? Um, so I come at it from a different angle for him. And that's why it's really. Wow. Special. So special. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So right now you're now teaching yoga and sound healing. Meditation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I own a yoga studio, fire shape for Tenafly. Where is that? So that's in Tenafly, New Jersey. So I own the studio. That's going to be nine years next year. Which wow. Which is pretty amazing. I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Um, and then I started doing the meditation and the Reiki. Probably over the past five years. More intently. What kind of Reiki? Sorry, you specified what type Karuna of Reiki. Karuna Reiki. Can you share? So it's Holy Fire. Okay. So I started off Reiki 1. It goes Reiki 1, Reiki 2, Master, and then Karuna Reiki. Master. Oh, wow. So with the Karuna Reiki, we integrate voice, so we'll do chanting. Oh, cool. Yeah. 
So again, the evolution. So I still get to use my voice. Yes, I have chills. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So it's really, really special. And what I love about Karuna Reiki, and I didn't know what Reiki was for a long time and I was scared of Reiki too because I was like I don't want anybody to touch my energy yeah this is weird yeah um but then a friend introduced me to it I had an amazing experience and then I met my Reiki master who became my you know Reiki teacher and then the journey evolved um but what I love about Karuna and the way that it's ex just described is loving compassion Mm. And I just think that that's such a beautiful. How is that different than any other Reiki? I know the Holy Fire, but like, what does that mean? They focus much more on the loving, compassion side of it, and the the idea of when someone like we inter we interact with many people. Mm -hmm. And some people might not be, I don't want to use the word behaving, the way that we think they should, right? But this idea that that person is simply unhealed, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it's such a beautiful way to see every one of us, right? It's just, I just have healing to do. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. I just have healing to do. Yeah, yeah. And when I meet someone else who maybe isn't working in my energy the way that I want them to, I can respond to them in such a different way if mm -hmm. I just understand that they just have healing to do. Yeah. And I can support you in such a different way when I see you that way. Yeah. From that lens. So that was like the big shift as I transitioned into Karuna. Wow. Yeah. It's so true. And that really breaks down our ego as well. Because when we see something that doesn't feel right to us or it's not how we would do it, mm -hmm. then our ego gets involved and then we're creating so much more resistance mm -hmm. when it's really just like we all have work to do. And that's how theirs is showing up. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So do you work one on one with clients? I or? do. So since COVID. Mm hmm. I don't even understand why we still have to talk about COVID, I but know. COVID was actually a gift for me. Funny enough, I did my Reiki master training the week before the world shut down. Wow. And my whole business shifted yeah. to online. And yeah. had I not done that training, I did teach yoga online, but I really loved sharing Reiki online yeah. and doing the meditations online. That was such a gift to be able to share that because people really needed that yeah. during COVID. So I created my online business during COVID. I went live every Monday through Friday at 7.45 a.m. every single day. And it was such a blessing yeah. to be able to do that. And I loved it because the yoga practice is incredible and this morning, teaching two classes was a reminder and testament to that always, the, the changes and the shift that can happen in that yoga room. But what I love about the Reiki and the meditation is there's no barrier, right? People might have physical barriers around why they think they can't do yoga that will stop them from getting into the yoga room, but I can get anyone to sit down on a chair. Right? Even if you can't sit on the floor, I can get you to sit on a chair yeah. and we can meditate. Yeah. And we can do Reiki. Um, so I'm so grateful of that evolution and that time that I had during COVID to really focus on the skills and continue yeah. to develop them. So I love doing Reiki online, funny enough. It's my favorite because I get to do it with people all over yeah. the world, which is. And it's wild to see their reaction of like, oh, my gosh, this really does work through technology. Which is and so I crazy. Know, I know. I know. You know, because they're kind of like, you can do Reiki on yep. a computer. I'm like, I don't even really technically need the computer. I could just yes. do it. But yeah, we do the computer thing just to make you feel like. Yeah, we're more connected. We're more connected. Yeah. Right. Um, so I do a lot of virtual now. So it's Spirit Warrior Nation is my virtual space. Wow. Yeah. And then, um, but I also have a Reiki studio in the, in the, in the, my brick and mortar business for anyone who wants in person. Beautiful. Yeah.
Yeah, I've done Reiki a few times and other energy healings like that. And it is wonderful because, like you said, you just need to sit down. You just need to lie down. And you don't have to do much. Nope. And I've said this before on the podcast. There were days when I was starting off as like a Kundalini teacher being like, oh, I wish I just taught Reiki because all I would need to do is be like, here, just sit here. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. I'm not going to put you in any weird poses and give you any right. panting dog breaths yeah. to do. You just sit here. <laughs> but um, and going back to what you said about Bikram, it's like we all find that one thing that helps us to activate our light and it's it's that initiation and right mm -hmm. now actually I feel like I'm kind of looking at things in hindsight of Kundalini has been such a huge part of my teachings and my journey and I do like I feel like there's more to come I don't know what exactly mm -hmm. it is but it this I owe everything to this practice because it's been the catalyst for the greatest change in my life and um, helped me to activate the healer within myself. Yeah. And it's, gr it's just cool to find that and to help others find that yeah. and then continue to explore. Cause we're always evolving. We're always changing. Exactly. And each level of ourselves calls for a different practice yes. or a different intervention or whatever it may be. Yeah. And I know recently you went through a really huge loss in your life I did, I did. do you want to share about that and how your practice yeah. came into play yeah um so i lost my mom in february uh it's my first time talking about it i shouldn't say it's my first time talking about it because i talk about it yeah by myself on instagram <laughs> yeah right i talked to a screen you're with yeah but it's my first time sitting with someone else yeah. and sharing about it um, but I'm so happy to share about it because I think it's so important and I think everyone needs, everyone will go through this yeah. at some point, which, you know, we don't like to acknowledge, Yeah. but it's the truth and understanding that will give you a lot of peace to help you through it. Yeah. Um, so yes, I lost my mom in February. She was my best, best friend in the whole world. Um, I joke that I probably spoke to her an unhealthy amount. My husband had to get used to the fact that my mom was my best friend. Aww. Right. Um, but they did, they loved each other very much. And I feel like, and what we all feel like in my family is that I was in training for 20 years for this, right? Since I started my practices, because it literally was everything that I've ever said, everything that I have ever taught. I had to actually put it into action. Yeah. And it was such a journey because she wasn't sick. She wasn't sick. She wasn't physically, she wasn't visibly sick, I should say, right? She was on no medication and she was only 72. So as far as we knew, we knew that, yeah, of course they were in the last quarter. Yeah. But never did we expect. Her dad lived to 96. Like we had no reason to think anything. So she had a heart um, valve that needed to be repaired. Okay. So it was monitored for two years. She was at the best hospital in New York City, one of the best robotic doctors. It was all mapped out. It was supposed to be easy breezy, 45 minute surgery. Oh, wow. Right? So it didn't go to plan. She had a very rare reaction. They'll never really know what it was. It could have been the anesthesia. You know, they really don't know. It's like a one in a million. There's not a lot of cases where what happened to her happens. Her heart just froze when they went to put the warm blood back in. Her heart just swole and stopped. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. So it was, you know, insane. But here's the thing. I went into the hospital that night. I got the call, I was a mess. I went into the hospital that night and I sat in the waiting area and I looked at my cousin and I said, she saw everyone. 
And my cousin looked at me and she said, don't say that. And I said, but I have to say it because I always see the signs. And if it was anything or anyone else, I would say it. And if it was a good sign, I would say it. Just because it's not what we want to yeah. hear. Yeah, yeah. My mom had a world tour for the last year of her life. She went on every trip. She saw every family member. She loved family. Family was her life. She saw every family member. Wow. On all the sides of her family. Of, her, of my dad's family. She saw everyone. She took every trip she wanted to take. She went to Florida twice. She took an extra trip that we were like, don't take that trip. She insisted. And I'm so glad she went. Yeah. So for me, I really felt like that was her karma. That was her gift. It was her blessing that she got to do that. And I saw it. I saw it that night. We continued. She was in the hospital for three weeks. They tried everything wow. under the sun to bring her back. And it was a really interesting journey with the conversation of faith, right? Because that first week, everyone, of course, was being amazing and wonderful and saying what they felt they needed to say. And everyone just kept saying, I'm praying for her. I'm praying for your mom to make it. I'm praying for her to get better. And about a week in, I was like, no. That's not actually the prayer. The prayer is, I'm praying for her highest good. Yeah. I'm praying for what's best for her. Because if she doesn't make it, and we were all praying for her to make it, then what happens to our faith? Yeah. And that was such a powerful moment for me. Yeah. Because I didn't want to lose my faith. And I didn't want everyone else to, to lose their faith. So I was like, rewind. We're not praying for her to make it. We're praying for what's best for her. So whatever that is, it's not about what we need. Yeah. It's about what's best for her. So for me, that really became my mantra. And it was that, it was that surrender. Right? That understanding that I don't have the answers. I'm not going to understand. I'm never going to know what happened in that operating room. And knowing isn't really going to change anything. Yeah. Right? So often everybody wants to know why. Why did this happen to her? Why? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that we cherish her only thing that matters is that we are grateful for every memory we had and that we pray for her peace mm. right so her funeral for me was not sad and I didn't let people wear black which is so ironic because I'm wearing black today and I don't usually wear black um it's my New York City vibe today. You needed the day to night right? vibe. You yes, said. <laughs> it was my day to night vibe. So I didn't, I made everyone wear blue, which was her favorite color. Aww. And I had everyone tell joyful stories of her because she was a huge joy in so many people's lives. And that's what her funeral was. And even her last hours in the hospital were so beautiful. And we sang, I played music, I played mantras, I, we prayed, we talked, we told stories, and it was joyful because that's who she was. And I wanted her to go with ease. Like that was my greatest wish. Yeah. I didn't want her to feel held here in any way. I wanted her to know that we were good. Yeah. And that she could go and she could fly. 
That's all I wanted for her. And she flew so fast and so strongly. It was so funny because I didn't even need the funeral. <laughs> the funeral was really for everyone else. Yeah. But on Friday, she passed. And by Monday, I was getting messages from her. Wow. It was so fast. And, but I was meditating every day. I was meditating every day. And I know that the reason that I'm able to connect with her so deeply and the reason that I'm able to hear her is because I meditate every day. Mm. Even if I'm laying down, okay? I'm still meditating. Yeah. You know, and, and I think it's important to share that, right? My, my journey has ebbed and flowed a lot this year. Yeah. Because it had to. My life has went through a, a traumatic, tremendous change. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we get so rigid with ourselves and our practices that we think they have to be this certain way. And it's like, it's okay. Yep. Let the practice evolve to whatever you need it to be right now. So true. Right? So right now, if I have to lay down to meditate, that's what I do. Yeah. I'm there to receive. Yeah. Right? So, um... My meditation, my yoga has been there for me every single time. And I really attribute the only reason that I've been able to get through this, to support my dad, to support my grandmother, who also lived with my mom, who now live with us, to support my two children, my husband, to continue to support my students. I'm grateful to my tribe that helped take care of my yoga studio during those first few months when I really couldn't. Yeah. Um, but it was my practices that have truly saved me. In those moments that are just so confronting of your greatest fear, when you can find the faith and the surrender in those moments, that is like the ultimate payback for all of the work that you've done. And it's like such an acknowledgement of all the work, inner work that you've done in those moments. I've had a few moments like those over the last two years. And you kind of have this moment of like, how did I get here? How am I able to shift the prayer mm. into her highest good yeah. instead of thinking about me yeah. right now? And that is, you know, it's divine. It's something greater than just us. Oh my that God. divine energy coming yes. in. And that's the faith. Yeah. Being able to so even get into that yeah. frequency. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so grateful for it. And it's so, and, and I use that word of, like, it's not me. Like, since things have happened, and the way my life has moved very quickly after my mom's passing, I'm like, it's not me. This isn't me. It's just through me. It's just through me. Mm. I'm being guided and I'm just tuned in and I'm just doing what I'm told. Yeah. I hear it and I just, even if it doesn't make sense, I go with it. Yeah. Because I'm just in that flow. And I do feel like the six months from when she passed were six of the most powerful months of my life, of my human and spiritual existence. Mm -hmm. And I know it's her guiding me, you know, and it's, in some senses, I say, you know, it's sad that I had to lose her to have this experience new experience of myself but I know that it's also her gift yeah and that it was just my this was the journey yeah. right this is what I had to go through yeah you know and I think that's like it's my favorite thing what you said the surrender to share with other people surrender because everything as humans we resist yeah we're always resisting we're resisting change we're resisting what's actually happening. 
We want it to be somewhere, something else. We want to be somewhere else. Yeah. We're always resisting what is. So true. You know, and it's like if we stop resisting and we just surrender to what is, you're going to laugh. My word for 2023, I said it on January 16th, which is two days before she went in for surgery. My word for 2023 was ease. Wow. I kind of laughed when it first yeah. happened, but I didn't know it actually was ease. Mm. There was ease this year for me. Wasn't the way that I thought it yeah. was going to be. Yep. But there was a lot of ease. Wow. There was ease in the decisions because I surrendered. Yep. And I just went where I was being told to go and I did what I was being, I just went with it. And that was the ease. The ease was that my husband showed up for me in ways that I, I can't put into words. Yeah. Right? There's yeah. ease in my family who showed up for me. That was the ease. There was yeah. ease in the love that surrounded me. So there was ease. But sometimes we get so stuck on wanting it to be. Like, that was my word. Yeah. And this yep. isn't, right? Mm -hmm. That we can't see it. But it's like, no, there was so much beautiful ease. I was surrounded with so much goodness. And it's emotional. And it's not emotion just because you're sad. It's emotion because you're like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Just life. Wow. Life is like what you said earlier about I like how you wish you had the perspective before, but it's kind of, that's kind of just how life works. Like we receive it when we're able to receive it in divine time when we're capable of receiving it and through really transformative experiences, sometimes wonderful ones and sometimes really freaking hard ones. And it's just like, how, why does life have to work this way? I know. Why does it have to work this way? Right, but like, like, why is giving birth so hard, right? Like you have to like go mm -hmm. through this really difficult yep. thing to get. Yeah. So you appreciate it. Yeah. Because <laughs> maybe if it was easy. Yeah. All right. We wouldn't always see the gifts. So true. What are your practices right now that you have each day that just really help you to mm -hmm. move forward? My number one practice, and I am not a morning person. I'm not a morning person. My number one practice is getting up an hour before I wake my kids to have quiet time. Yeah. To journal, to drink my coffee in peace important to me yeah um so i do it i get up an hour before when it's still dark out that's number one um number two practice is my meditation every day no matter what it looks like mm -hmm. finding it even if it's just seven minutes even if it's a guided from an app for seven minutes in my car find a moment to be still yeah have to um, I feel like my yoga and meditation have to be lumped into one because I need to give you another practice, which is, um, which is joy. Yeah. I've been really allowing myself to have joyful experiences and not feeling bad about it because that's what my mom would want for me. Mm-hmm. She wants to see me shine. She was my biggest cheerleader. She was like my biggest support. And she wants to see me shine. So it would be a disservice to her if I didn't let my joyful spirit and my light shine. So I make sure I'm finding joy. So that's why we're in the day to night look today. I love I'm it. gonna go out and I'm <laughs> gonna have some fun and I'm gonna see friends and I'm gonna connect and have those you know, those meaningful connection times. Because if anything that I've learned this year, all the other stuff doesn't matter. Yeah. It really doesn't matter. It's so true. The only thing that matters is the people that you connect with and filling that space 
fostering those deep connections, sharing your love with the people, you know, yeah. saying the things, say the things. Oh my gosh, please say the things. Yeah. Tell the people that you love them. That was my greatest gift. I have no regrets with my mom. I told her everything well before any of this happened. She knew how much I loved her. So like I tell everyone, I'm like, tell your people. Yeah. Because it could happen at any time. You could be walking down the street. You know, so tell your people how important they are to you. Don't wait. And just how good it feels. Like how good it feels to know and hear. Now. That, yeah, now. And to tell enjoy that now. love now. Yeah. Enjoy it now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. You are such a sweet soul. Thank you. And just... I think the messages that you shared here today can help so many people. I hope so. Especially if they're going through anything similar. Yeah. But like you said, it's it's life and it's part of life. And in some way, we've all been through it, whether yeah. it's someone we love who have been through it or yeah. if we personally have. And I think so much of what you shared is going to touch the hearts of so many. I hope so. And I That's thank you. So I thank you for sharing so much of it from your heart and your soul. Thank you for having me. Thank you. That was so nice to chat. So nice to meet you <laughs> and chat too. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. Thank you so much for being here. And if you know anyone who maybe just needs to hear Tara's message today, please, as always, feel free to share the episode with someone you love, someone who you think this would resonate with. I'm always so grateful to tune in, to have guests here, to pop up with solo episodes, and to connect with you guys and hear what you've taken from the episodes. So as always, thank you so much for being here and I'll see you next time. May the long time sun shine upon you. Satnam.